most places, like, and catch crabs, like, you know. And when, there were, when the crabs was, uh, like, what you call white crabs, you, you could lift your pots up and you, you couldn't see the pot for crabs, you know. That's your catch fish. Your place. You could make a decent life, uh, I reckon, from fishing. But uh, as the years has gone on, where I, I didn't know, like I think uh, the pollution has a lot to do with uh, shellfish, you know, this slurry and uh, the waste. When the first starters dropped the waste in the water, like it was, you had these big beers, you know, and the stuff you used to just wash up into the beers. And uh, now there's been that much stuff, the waste is encroaching onto the, what you call the marine habitats of the shellfish where they used to come into breed, the hot lobster grounds, and the, fi the shellfish is just not coming there now, like, you know. But I think uh, the best alternative would be in the landfills, like, there's Hawthorn Quarry, there's Tut Hill Quarry, there's Thrizzleton Quarry, all places where they could dump quarry waste. But uh, as far as doing away with jobs, if you stop the, the waste and the slurry, I think that's a red urn because what do they do in Yorkshire? What do they do in the Midlands? You know, what do they do with their stuff? That's not closing their collieries. The facts are that they've used this black melon threat for the last 15 years. And in that 15 years, the number of collieries in this locality have been reduced from 36 down to 6. That speaks for itself. Now the environmental situation has gone from bad to worse. Looking back, it was obvious that London, there is a, a coal owner, was more environmentally conscious than what the current uh, industrialists are. He built the town with a purpose-built network of internal railways. London had his own wagon making shops, he had his own local manufacturing shops. So that as the town grew with considerable sized ancillary uh, works, they were all geared to this internal network of railways. Old Faithful here was built in 1873 and she's still willing and able. This coffee pot type of engine ran in the dock area as recently as up to about 15 years ago. In the last decade, the whole of that structure of railways had been destroyed, with the horrendous result that we've got a traffic problem on, and I stress the word, residential roads. A lot of the traffic prevails 24 hours a day. This fleet of tankers carrying this horrendous sludge There's an ever increasing amount of coal being imported. Uh, further evidence is you open cast operators running fleets of vehicles day after day through the town, picking up this foreign coal and taking it back to their points of production. I would describe them, and I don't apologize for my strong language, as uh, industrial vandals. They're just raping and pillaging the town for a quick book. The issues are rather large for us in town council. We seem to be in a cleft stick. It's a governmental problem. Although they are washing their hands of the situation, the government have said that the polluter must pay. And therefore, if, if the local collieries had to uh, uh, pay all the monies uh, to get rid of the, the, the spoil in any other way, including the slurry, it would cost X number of millions of pounds and effectively would close the local collieries down within months. I myself am a British coal employee. I work at Jordan Quarry. I don't particularly like to see uh, my job being put on the line for the want of uh, dirt on the beaches. But on the other hand, I have to recognize that these beaches are now despoiled beyond belief. So I can't see any immediate end to the problem until the actual um, quarries do eventually close through natural reasons. If this uh, working time of the quarries was to be seen to its actual finish, I would be a very happy man. I can't um, see that happening, however, particularly with, with all of the environmental issues, the governmental issues. Um, I think CM will eventually, um, certainly within the next 15 years, 
not be a mining town at all. We are now in the advent of new factory estates going up and bringing a different type of people into the town. Um, and I've seen a lot of the town taken away, but I wouldn't say it to its detriment. Although the bottle works didn't operate when I was a boy, it was still there, it still existed. Uh, it's all now demolished. There was a big gas depot here with a gas hub. They have all gone. The closure of the same colliery. There is a scarcity of jobs at the moment, but you'll find even with the colliery closing down, you'll find a lot of the firms that are coming to the Pete Lee area, Aircliff area and that, they find that miners are easily adjustable to other forms of work because they are manual workers. There's four faces working at Billion. Three of them's under the sea. And the other one's like travelling up past sea. And there's another two being developed, so there's six. You know. She's viable at the minute. But next week she might not be. You know, you didn't like talk about yours now, we'll British call you talk from week to week. You know? Now we've only got about 40%, you know, 35, 40% of the men from the local, the local community. 60% of the lads, they're all busted in. And if there was a closure now, if there was a closure next week, we couldn't tap them in. There's no call, you know, the other five pits couldn't tap them in. I uh, do the teacher training course, but when you got the student come out, there was a glut of teachers, and it was fairly hard to get a job. At the time, the opportunity was there. I started seeing, I was doing the same then. So I started over at the NAC in 77. It was a really friendly, close-knit, nice little bit to work at. Subconsciously, you're always aware that it's uh, a dangerous place to, to be in. I mean, uh, this other lad was sent in to uh, put girders up in a panel house, uh, which was unstable. Stone came away and knocked myself to the ground, and uh, I was unable to get up in time from the small amount of stone before. There was another fall of a lot heavier stuff, and uh, I was trapped for about an hour and ten minutes. I was fairly lucky not to be flattened altogether, and very lucky to be pulled out by a brilliant set of lads. My right foot was severely crushed. So I ended up uh, with after about nine or ten weeks in hospital with amputation uh, of just below my right knee. And after that, it was fairly quickly out of hospital, but obviously the recovery period's quite a while. So all in all, I was off work for about a year, during which the NAC, the same quarry, was closed. And we were transferred down to the Tempest, which is where I'm at now, obviously working at service. Still the atmosphere, still the people. Although things have changed drastically since the strike, the people that uh, are in friendly ways, there are a lot of them, and uh, amongst us, there's still a tremendous atmosphere, even at work. The lad where he lives in the town, then we just, if they want us, they can come and knock on the door. But lads travelling from um, outlying districts, We've got to be prepared to put that bit extra time in for to catch them and save them. You know, they need access to their secretary, which I've always given them, you know. Because they're always dashing for a bus, so you've got to be there for them. If British Coal has got out to put out of us, it's not good for us. I mean, we always get threatened with the closure of our quarries if we act up, you know. Six to seven years, Vienna will be gone, because that's, that's the reserves we've got. So whatever happens, it's gone and gone. You know, so it's, it's in the men's best interest to get the best out of it through the union, because British coal is not going to give them that. You know, they just cast you to one side. He's always been a union man. When we were caught, you know, he was only 16, 17 year old. And uh, he used to break dates, you know, because he had to go to a union meeting and stick his hand up, you know. But uh, I understand everything he does, and I back him all the way. 
so I'm a caretaker at um, an infant school the same uh, I love it you know it's children from three year old to seven and uh, it's like having about 150 grandchildren you know I love it uh, it's hard work I've got one cleaner who's part time and other than that I do all the work in the school you know, I saw and fix things you know and just like well it was a man's job and I'm the first woman to have this job so I'm very proud <laughs> well I think the North East men are still a bit chauvinistic you know we're coming on mine the women are coming on I've got anti apartheid meetings uh, women against fit closures I'm involved in that we have the Friends of Parkside school meetings we have them so I'm very busy it's a town council where I'm on, and we do parks, recreation areas. Um, the general idea is just to keep the community tidy and uh, to get this town up to standard for the amenities that we have. But uh, that's the sort of thing I do. If people come to the house with complaints, I go in touch with the higher councils like district or county. The district of Easington came into being after local government reorganisation in 1974, combining CM Urban District and Easington Rural District. We've always had unemployment problems. If you look at the region, it was dependent upon the old heavy industry, shipbuilding, steel manufacture and coal mining. It is ironic, perhaps, that shortly after the war, 1947, there was a great drive to increase coal production. And I think it was the Minister of Fuel and Power at the time, Manny Shinwell, who was actually MP for the Easington area, who was charged with the responsibility of maintaining and increasing coal production. Residential training centres were opened at Easington and New Kyle in Durham. A nationwide campaign told the young men of the country about the New Deal for miners. The world economy has changed and currently the impact that the world coal market uh, has on pricing, the prospect of private ports being built to import overseas sources of coal can have a, a major influence on the existence, the future existence of our collieries. Sea and Harbour, of course, is no longer a Londonderry town. Their influence disappeared almost entirely with nationalisation in 1947. But the town still has many links and reminders of the Londonderries. After the First World War in 1919, the 7th Marquess, now in command, threw a huge garden fete at Seam Hall for 10,000 of his workers. Everything seemed set fair. Yet, three years later, because of the economic situation, there was an enormous auction and everything was cleared out. There were rumors that the Londonderries were about to desert the town. This, of course, did not happen. In 1923, the seventh Marquess sank the new pit, the Tempest Pit, began a huge extension at CM Docks and built aged miners' homes on the sea front. Socially, they played a much less important role. The glory days of visits from royalty and the most important people of the land were now almost at an end. turn of the century, the North Dock became too small and the Marquis created the large outer piers and the South Dock, uh, which enabled him to handle much larger ships, principally coal exports and probably peaking at 3 million tonnes a year in the 1930s. I came here in December 1977. Um, and the first meeting I attended then 
was with National Coal Board who told us that they would not be shipping any more coal from Siam. That was a big blow. We then had to start to look for other cargoes, pull all the coal staves down, which were mostly in state of disrepair. And we now have what we consider to be a, a very modern facility, which is going to have quite a considerable future. London Dairies retained the shareholding until 1981. Uh, but from 1981, Burnett and Hallamshire Holdings acquired all the shareholding of the company. And then in April of this year, it changed again, and we're now a wholly owned subsidiary of Anglo United PLC. Coal's probably now only 10% of the cargoes that we handle. There's more coming in than going out. We realise it's not going to be here forever, and all our efforts have been to make the port viable in the absence of coal. Many of the people to whom we deliver cargoes or receive cargoes from have no real connection, so it has to come by road. We do accept that road traffic causes problems, um, but it's, it's an inevitable consequence of our success. It's a demonstration, uh, a march and an eventual rally against the importation of South African coal, which we believe, although the docks deny it, is coming in through the docks at Seam. It's a show of solidarity with the South African miners. We're also here because every nut of coal that comes into that uh, dock is um, putting the nail in the coffin of the tow quarries that we have in this town. We're hoping to like, um, get a proper movement in Seam with trade union this, um, activists, community leaders, you know, the district councils and people like that, to try and bring one to the people that uh, we need to stop this coal coming into the same other docks. I mean, in my personal situation, every time I hear the word South Africa and South African coal, I hear screams. You know, screams of, of children, most of them teenagers, some of them as young as eight or nine, who are uh, abducted and incarcerated, whose parents never see them for many, many months who suffer the degradation of torture, both physical and mental, all in the name of a regime that relies on Western industrialised societies for its support. Now, a famous author once said, you can judge a society by the way it treats its children. And I think that's what we're doing here today. We're giving our judgment to P.W. Porter and, and the apartheid disgusting regime that South Africa represents. I think everybody knows what's happening in South Africa. You know? Now, these people have asked us to stop importing their coal, you see, because it would uh, help to get rid of the apartheid. And also, it would help to save our mines, because the more coal they bring in, the more mines they close here. And that's how men need to work, you see. So, uh, but my feelings is, I think, mostly what's happening in South Africa. We know they bring in and blended coal from Rotterdam and Antwerp. Burnett and Hampshire have got three massive open cask mines in South Africa with a lousy employment record for their black workers. What they constantly argue with us in the European Parliament is that coal is just another commodity like any other that should be bought and sold as cheaply as possible in the world market. I mean, the fact is there's no such thing as a free and fair world market in coal. We've got governments elsewhere subsidising coal to the hilt to try and move in and undermine our indigenous coal industry and fix prices at whatever level they like. I questioned the junior minister on the level of imports into the port of Siam and also the country of origin. The reply, and I find this rather incredible, Siam and Sunderland for the purpose of inland revenue accounting is classed as one port and therefore the figures for Siam are not available. <laughs> My next move will be to ask for this cloak of secrecy to be lifted over the question of imports into the port of Siam, a town built upon coal and a town which had a reputation for exporting coal.
for sale. Weekend home with views across the South Downs and the Yorkshire Dales. Excellent sailing and golf. Hot running water, cold running water. Good fishing, home cooking, friendly neighbours, large back garden. When you own a caravan, great weekends and holidays are round the corner. Just get up and go. For a free guide, ask your dealer. Which compact powder gets your whites ultra white and squeezes a bit off the price? Daz Ultra, at a price that's right. For this month only, Northeast Stargazers will be treated to a unique sight. As usual, you'll see millions of shining stars, but none will be as brilliant as the stars you'll find on selected Fords at your local Northeast Ford dealers. Each star is worth at least £250 off the price of the car. So catch sight of this, and you'll know you're in for a great deal. Or, if you hurry, you could find one of these and save at least £1,750. And... Ah! Has anyone got 5p? Northeast Ford dealers, always a great deal to offer. Delivery, love. Great. I've been waiting for this. You can never be too careful when it comes to home security. Thank you. No, thank you. Keep your front door safely between you and any stranger. Fantastic. No matter who you are. Crime. Together we'll crack it. lived off the beach as children and obviously supplemented, without being aware of it, supplemented the family income. I was born in a multi-storey hovel. Um, it housed 18 tenants uh, and in total about 126 human beings sharing about four toilets, a couple of wash houses, that sort of thing. And until the early 50s, what you say is council houses are here now, were all the old back-to-back -back curry houses. Communal taps, about every 10 houses in the street. Uh, toilets, or as a better known here, netties across the road. Uh, that prevailed until uh, just 30 years ago. On this site, in the late 1920s, as a boy, I ran in rapture because this was the site of my grandfather's car house farm. But it was soon to become part of Siam's most spectacular social success story, the building of the car house estate of council houses, uh, later to be renamed Deanside. Siam had the worst death rate in the county and in 1926 when this estate first started child deaths were double the county average in 10 years the health of the people had been improved beyond recognition with wash away toilets electricity and gardens people moving up from those insanitary slums said it was just like going to heaven Home ownership in the whole of Easington district is lower than national average. Within Siam, about 30% of people own their own homes, and this low ownership rate reflects the fact that most of the homes were built in the first place by the colliery owners. Subsequently, the former councils obviously mounted a very large building program uh, to provide better 
living conditions. And it's only in recent years the private sector has come to build within Easington District. I mean, the houses that are being built in Seam, the jobs aren't in Seam, people travel. People travel to Durham, to Sunderland, to Newcastle to work. And fair enough, they do bring part of the wages back into the town. But the gentrification of Seam is only happening in the nice areas. Somebody driving through Seam may have a nice attitude towards it. But unfortunately, people only look at the three or four percent who are making money, you know, and the people in jobs. They don't realise that there's a, there's a, it's, it's like an iceberg. You know, there's an undercurrent there. There's, there's, there's a mass in seam that are living in poverty and will be subjected to abject poverty if the industry goes in the future. I would hate to see some kind of entrepreneurial, paternalistic attitude come back again. I mean, all it did was rake off the profits and, and, and put nothing back. It was only really after uh, nationalisation that people started to get a fairly living out of the coal industry and the town did prosper quite a bit through that. I think what we need to do is bring some industry back into the area that people can have a part in and not be just a part of. Ventilation was bad. Of course, unfortunately, in the 30s, the private owners used to lay the men off work and, and sack them for a period because of the you know shortage of trade. So you never knew whether you were going to work or whether you, you know whether you were off work. And then as the years went on, under nationalisation, there was a big change because of the change of the act. The Mines and Quarries Act, which meant the roadways had to be, ex you know, improved and extended. Ventilation was better. There's no question about nationalisation was uh, a big, vast improvement over the years for the miners. On New Year's Day, 1947, the coal mines of Britain became the property of the people. 1,000 mines passed to the control of the National Coal Board. I remember going through the pit gates and I had a different feeling. It's hard to describe, young fella. Uh, never much interested in anything. You get down the pit, you, you, you do your stint, you get out as sharp as you can. But that day it felt different, you know. I was naive enough to think that the pits actually belong to us now. And uh, I'm so disillusioned, I'm so found that the same gaffers with a different cap on. Nationalisation of the pits in Seam was a very quiet affair. Flags were flown from the pit head, but nothing seemed to have changed for the ordinary miners. The Londonderries, for their part, cushioned by generous compensation, uh, bore no ill will. In fact, they made several presents to the town. The North Terrace, the foreshore, the sea banks for a mile to the north, the rock house Dean, were all handed over to the council. At that time, they still belonged to the Londoners. I think that they were well compensated, and to some degree, would still carry the legacy of that, where money might well have been better invested at an earlier stage in modernising the pits. Um, a vast amount of, of government resources was channelled into uh, compensating the mine owners. The whole of the country was totally dependent upon coal for its energy needs. The interests of the miners could well have been furthered much stronger. But I think the concept of nationalisation watered down the attitude of the miners in relation to wages and conditions. Part of the New Deal was the chance of having a say on how the industry was to be run. Joint consultative committees were set up at all levels. Well, it was crucified like many other socialist uh, ideals. There's one time, I mean, to say, at least they would recognise you had a complaint and they would uh, listen to it. But nobody they couldn't care less. 
There's no such thing as this comprehension now. Nationalisation brought prosperity and security to the people who worked in the three mines at Seam. When I started at Dorden in 1963, no one knew of the undersea faulting which was found later, and everyone believed and there was great.